Since January, the global food industry and its consumers have doubled down on securing food supplies. Are we about to see 10 years of commitment to sustainable behaviours abandoned as we emerge from the COVID-19 crisis? Meet Juan Hagriano, Kerry's Group Head of Sustainability. And welcome to On The Horizon, a webcast series from Kerry Group discussing top of mind business issues during the COVID-19 crisis. I'm your host, Damien McLaughlin from University College Dublin. Juan, the worst economic downturn of modern times, a stretched food supply chain, and the consumer very, very concerned about their own personal safety. Is there any way that sustainability can retain its prominence on society's agenda? Great question, Damien. Thanks for that. Um, let me try to give you a perspective. I think four out of the six uh, emerging trends post-COVID have a relationship to sustainability. So sustainability is here to stay. It's not going to go away. I heard a good uh, quote the other day. Uh, it's difficult to live a healthy life in an unhealthy planet. I think that is a very good summary of where we are today. Yeah. So some of the trends are, uh, you mentioned already, food safety and trust and transparency. One third, well, three, four, three quarters of consumers, excuse me, uh, want to know more about safety, what's on their plate, is it good for me? Is it safe for me? 51% of consumers want to understand what's inside my food. Right? So this is a long trend that's been there, but it's just been accelerated by COVID. So the implications for manufacturers there is clean labeling and reformulating, etc., with natural ingredients from food, for food, rather than artificial and chemicals. Uh, and th- another interesting trend, which is also a long trend, which is also accelerated by COVID, is that uh, 48% of consumers are ready to pay more for local foods, food they know, food that is local. Uh, If you look at in the last five years, this is a US statistic, uh, the products that were uh, branded with some type of sustainability benefit, locally produced, organic, the last five years grew five times faster than the average retail products. Mm-hmm. So, and they, they really represented the majority of the purchases by consumers and the majority of the growth for the brands that sold them. So these are three trends which are underlying long-term trends that are being uh, accelerated, if anything, by COVID. Mm. You have new trends like the immunity, consumers, uh, not that it wasn't there, but in the food that I eat, uh, can I have uh, benefits for my immunity system? It used to be more an area where people would take um, dietary supplements, pills, or other types of uh, small shots, uh, beverage shots, uh, nutri- uh, nutritional bars, etc. But nowadays, you see that mainstream. It's very interesting to see some of the really big mainstream brands, juice brands, uh, launching big time with uh, vitamins and cultures in a juice, right? Big mm. prominent uh, launch in the UK recently with one top brand in the juice brand in the UK. You also have uh, ingredients like uh, beta-glucans, Wellmune, in many mainstream products. So that is really accelerating one-third of consumers are proactively looking for ingredients that help their immunity. They're also looking at more traditional things, but in a modernized version like botanicals, ginseng, ginkgo, lavender, the halo of health that drives immunity uh, in the food they, they, they eat, right? So that's the second big trend, more, more health. Now, I think the, another trend that is being accelerated is I want to understand if the, the diets I'm eating and the foods, ingredients that is in the food are uh, good for my health. So uh, information on the pack, like Nutri-Score, which is going to be, uh, is already existing in some countries, but it's going to be widely adopted in Europe, is again something that is increasing in demand from uh, COVID. And uh, you have applications, apps, where you can scan the food. In France, very popular app. You scan the food and it tells you what, it gives you a score for the food. It tells you how good or bad it is from a nutritional point of view. 
and it even uh, proposes alternatives. Very interesting model. Yeah. And so the usage of this type of apps is also increasing in COVID. Mm. Another area which is interesting is the innovation, Damien. We, we see uh, plant protein was uh, it's a long-term trend again, but it used to be driven mostly by people that had vegan diets, vegetarian diets. Today, you see many people that are uh, so-called flexitarians, an interesting name, but that means they want to eat more plant protein in their diet. And so plant protein is growing very, very quickly. So are non-alcoholic beers, protein bars, uh, cold brew coffee, uh, all of these uh, interesting uh, innovations that are coming to hit the industry started before COVID, but are being accelerated post-COVID. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then last but not least, yes, Damien, you have a question? No, no, go ahead. Good. Yeah. I think last but not least, and I finish here, is the environmental sustainability uh, the, 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 the big picture around uh, climate and energy and carbon. So 50% of consumers, it's a staggering number, it's never been so high, are looking at to consume uh, more responsibly the food that they have every day on their plate. Again, some of the examples we gave before, plant protein is not only eaten because of nutritional and health issues, but also because of the consumers know that the environmental impact is mm. excellent. Yeah. And uh, big brands are making uh, advertising around the life cycle analysis, a very technical term that they're doing and comparing their plant burger versus a meat burger and saying, hey, it's 80% less water, 80% less carbon in the production. Right? Mm -hmm. So I think that there is a lot of interest here. Obviously, you have to balance this with affordability and cost. Uh, yeah. We are facing an economic crisis. But I think the trend here is these are not niche anymore. They're moving from uh, niche brands to mainstream brands and to private label. And so the mm -hmm. affordability of these products is 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 something that is uh, mainstream. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Juan, uh, you've given an excellent sort of overview of the consumer side and the demands that consumer will have. And unsurprisingly, they have focused heavily uh, or in your in your view and on the base of your research, they're focusing heavily on health, immunity, wellness, like the idea of the consumer protecting themselves. But in order for us to have a healthy planet, I liked your quote at the start, a healthy planet and a healthy, uh, a healthy citizen, um, industry really needs to act and particularly needs to act on, uh, on carbon emissions. When you look at the kind of investments that the great food producers are making, I'm sure they're making investments to meet consumer demands, but are they also making investments to uh, improve their carbon footprint? Uh, wh what does the balance of investment look like between the two? Again, great question, uh, Damien. Um, good example that comes to mind, which is an example of a win-win, right, is uh, very large brewing brands, uh, the largest brewing company in the world, and top brands have announced that they're going to brew their uh, brand on 100% renewable electricity. They're putting that on the pack, yeah. means on the can, so brewed 100% uh, on renewable electricity in the US, in Europe, in China, in the top three markets. So this is not a small mini brand. It's, it's a big investment. You're going to 100% renewable electricity, uh, many companies are setting up what they call, uh, just two, two words of technicality here, virtual PPAs. This, they, they, they're establishing a, an agreement with a utilities provider, and the utilities provider arranges the, the, the renewable electricity across all their sites. So it's not an agreement one per one. So they will put extra uh, renewable electricity capacity on the line, Mm. And they will supply. Uh, they will supply the brands. Right. In this case, it could be a solar uh, photovoltaics uh, park in south of Spain, or it could be wind energy in the North Atlantic, etc. Right. So you have both the, the operations, the, the companies uh, operating on renewable electricity, which nowadays is close to parity in in, in a number of regions already. Uh, parity, grid parity means similar price to traditional fossil fuels. 
but the consumers uh, express their preference. The brands express the differentiation by the logo on the pack, and the consumers express their difference by uh, giving preferential uh, behaviors, <laughs> consumption to these brands. Right? Another example um, would be a, non, uh, a, a plant-based uh, milk, so-called milk, which is uh, so-called yeah, milk. Oh, so-called milk, but it's it's flying off the shelves, yeah. and it has a carbon uh, logo on the pack saying, "Okay, the footprint of these is so much more efficient and less uh, carbon, etc." So it's mainstreaming, and a uh, little bit of a long answer, but really very interesting to see. I've been a long term time in sustainability, uh, mm. and and you can see that there's been trials before in and out. But this time you're talking about mainstream brands and very interesting uh, yeah. products. Yeah. Juan, uh, one of the things I guess we've all seen uh, in supermarkets uh, and heard about at, 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 um, at retailer and, and I guess governmental level has been the stockpiling of, of food and, and consumers are leaving supermarkets with vast quantities of foods in their, in their shopping uh, carts and, and loading them into their car and driving home. Um, uh, is there... A possibility or a likelihood or what is your sense of the impact of this kind of stockpiling on the food waste crisis? I mean, we've always said a third of all food was uh, was wasted. But are we likely to, to see a surge in food waste post COVID-19 as um, as this stockpiling um, works its way through the system? Yeah, you use the word crisis. I think that that's the adequate term, right? We we do waste thirty three percent of the food every day. Food loss or food waste, uh, one third of that every day. That's about if you make the mathematics, is about uh, one hundred eighty five kilos per uh, inhabitant over the year. So over half a kilo every single day is wasted. Um, the pandemic period has not been good for food waste. Uh, obviously, the loss of business in food service has made, uh, there were a lot of suppliers that had, had stocks, products prepared um, for delivery, and they have had to write off at least two months, if not three months of those, right? Mm. So there will be a surge. The likelihood of uh, Consumers also having to throw away more things because they stockpile and uh, they go past the product expiration, past due dates, is also likely uh, to create an increase in uh, food waste statistics mm. uh, late, le uh, when we record this uh, later in the year. Is it permanent? Hopefully not. We, we have to tackle food waste. It's, it's, it's one of the best ways that the industry and uh, the consumers have to contribute to a lower environmental footprint. Imagine the amount of energy and water embedded into every kilo that we mm -hmm. throw every day. Yeah. Yeah. So how can we tackle it, Juan? What are the, is there, is this just a behavioral change? We have to change shopping, shopping behaviors or are there some new technologies there that we could work with? Because this is, as you say, is a scandalous situation uh, in global society. Yeah, that's, uh, the solution is not, uh, Simple, there are no silver bullet here. So consumers need to change their behaviors, responsible consumption, uh, better, uh, better habits, basically uh, buying less portions, managing the fridge. <laughs> when you go to the restaurant, ordering the right portions. Even when you order food service delivery home, make sure you don't over order. It's typical, you yeah. over order and there is 30%, 50% left over. Yeah. You keep it for the next day and never finish it. So yeah. there is a lot of behavioral there. Yeah. There is also things that the industry, the value chain needs to do. Right? So at the, at the farm level and the supply chain, and unfortunately in emerging countries, a lot of times it's the cold chain breaks and the products go literally rotting on the side of the road. So better infrastructure will help in emerging markets. But food waste is a lot lower in emerging markets, 20% only. Uh, big culprits are... Uh, America, unfortunately, is top of the charts here. 40% of the food, by all estimates, is wasted there every day. Uh, mm. But Europe is not always much better, you know, 25 30%, depending on the countries. Mm. I think the industry uh, has a lot of uh, smart technologies that, that we could use. Right? 
repurposing waste into ingredients. We've done that historically. We have some examples like in dairy, for instance, whey is a relatively low value byproduct, but you can repurpose that into very high uh, nutritious protein uh, for performance. Uh, you can imagine uh, taking stocks and uh, the grandmother cooking the chicken on Sunday and if you repurpose that, what's left of the chicken into soup on Monday. Well, you can do, the industry has been doing that for a long time. So there are things that are already done which respect the principles of the circular economy, but there's a lot more that can be done. Okay, so bioprocessing, fermentation, uh, a number of other things can be done there. Then there is the, the whole thing around shelf life, right? Can we replace, uh, the consumer doesn't want, we talked about that clean label, once clean label, sorry, doesn't want artificial preservatives, doesn't want uh, chemical preservatives. So what you do is you have to have natural preservation systems that protect the food longer, uh, if possible, but with no chemicals. So you are using here solutions which are um, uh, might sound to some of us, uh, how could I say, traditional, but which are very powerful, right? Mm. Because you're using solutions which are vinegar-based solutions. You're using fermentation metabolites. You're using natural functional flavors, protective cultures, plant extracts, all food-based solutions that help increase, protect the food, less uh, oxidation, less uh, microbial activity, which means the, sp the food doesn't spoil, the food doesn't rot, stays mm. longer, fresher, and you minimize the food waste, right? Mm. So this is an example solution. There are other innovations which are uh, around plastic uh, or smart packaging. So how do you replace single-use plastic and at the same time keep food safety, it's difficult, right? Yeah. So you need to have innovations on packaging. And then finally, technology, digital solutions. Optimize, the retailers can optimize the category management using a number of uh, sensors on the package. When the food gets bad, it automatically detects it or artificial intelligence mm. or other types of big data and blockchain in the supply chain that help you trace the food and minimize the losses. Yeah, well, it's a tremendous uh, it's a tremendous survey, and I guess the the good news for those of us who who have a commitment to sustainability, particularly in the food industry, is that there are some strong beacons uh, of hope. Thank you for your time today, Juan. We appreciate we appreciate it and, and your expertise. We have been on the horizon. Stay safe, stay well, and see you next time. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.